Hello, everybody. Welcome to lecture nine, which is the first lecture of week five. So we're in section 2.1 of the lecture notes. And our theme today is the topic of subspaces of a vector space. So generally, when you're doing kind of abstract algebra and you're working in structures that are defined by their properties via some axioms, it's very typical that you're interested in sort of subsets within the overall structure that also unto themselves share similar properties. And an example of that is a subspace of a vector space. So suppose we have a vector space V over a field F. So that means that V is a collection of objects that can be added together, subtracted from each other, and multiplied by scalars from the field F. So think of the two by two matrices over the real numbers or the column vectors of length three over the real numbers, or R2, the, 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 the Euclidean plane, whatever. So a subset U of V is referred to as a subspace or vector subspace if with the addition and scalar multiplications of V, U itself satisfies all the requirements to be a vector space. Again, there are two specific things that are really needed in order to confirm that. I mean, because U lives within this bigger vector space V, elements of U can be added together within V and multiplied by scalars within V. So we don't have to, that doesn't have to be checked really. But what does have to be checked in order to determine whether u is a vector subspace of v or just a subset is that if we take two elements of u and add them together in v that the result of that should be always in u if u is to be a, a subspace so the lingo for that is it must be you must be closed under the addition of v that means that when we take elements of u and add them in v that we still stay within u and the second requirement is that u should be closed under multiplication by scalars so if we take an element of u, multiply it by a scalar. So of course we get an element of v as the result, but we want that to be an element of u as well. So if both of these conditions are satisfied, that u is closed under addition, meaning when you take two elements of u and add them, it's just, the result is still in u, and closed under scalar multiplication, meaning when you take an element of u, multiply it by a scalar, that you're still within the subset u. If both of those conditions are satisfied, then u is itself a vector space living inside this bigger vector space v or potentially bigger vector space and we say that u is a subspace of v in that situation so the kind of habit and inclination to to recognize vector subspaces and also to recognize subsets that are not vector subspaces is something that's in quite important in, in the practice of linear algebra so we look at a few examples of that okay so here are a couple of examples. So our first example, our vector space is a set of all polynomials with rational coefficients. So that thing is denoted by Q square back of X. Q is the indeterminate or variable in the polynomials. So Q of X is a set of all polynomial expressions in X whose coefficients are rational numbers. So for example, if you want to write down an element of QX, a typical element of qx would be something like x squared plus three quarters x plus two, something like that. So a polynomial expression, it has rational coefficients for various powers of x and only a finite number of powers can appear in any particular polynomial. Okay, so qx is a vector space. Its elements can be added together, they can be subtracted from each other. We just get elements of qx as the result of either of those operations and they can be multiplied by rational scalars and we still stay within qx. Okay, so within qx, we're gonna look at the subset, which we call p2, consisting of all those polynomials whose degree is at most two. So p2 within this larger space qx, so this one is a typical element of qx, of course not everything in qx has degree at most two. So for example, x to the five minus x cubed is also in qx. But P2 is that subset of QX consisting of the elements that look like this. They can have a constant term, a degree one term with the coefficient, and a degree two term possibly with the coefficient. So A0, A1, A2 here can be any rational numbers, but these are the only potentially non-zero coefficients that appear in elements of P2. Okay, the assertion is that P2 is a vector subspace of QX. So to confirm that, what we have to do is satisfy ourselves that if we take two elements, FX and GX, rational polynomials of degree at most two, so they both look like this. And if we add them together, then we again get a rational polynomial of degree at most two, and that certainly is true. 
if fx and gx both have terms that are at most quadratic, then nothing of higher degree than that is going to turn up in the sum fx plus gx. If fx is a rational polynomial of degree at least two, again, so that means it, it, you know, it, it, has this it has this appearance, it looks like this, for some a0, a1, a2, and if we multiply that by any rational scalar, then we just have the effect of multiplying the coefficients by that rational scalar, and certainly the degree does not uh, go up above two if we do that. So P2 is a subset of Qx that is closed under addition and under multiplication by scalars, so it's a subspace of Qx. Just a comment on that, uh, a sort of a related example. So this is a remark, I guess, or a note. So in Qx, the set V, let's call it V. Actually, let's not call it V. It's a, it looks like a, it makes it look like a vector space. The set S of all polynomials of degree exactly two. So we just saw that the set of all polynomials of degree at most two is a subspace. But if we take the set of all polynomials of degree exactly two, that's not a subspace. And it's not, uh, one, one way to see that is that it's not closed under addition. If you take two quadratic polynomials, it is not necessarily true that their sum is again a quadratic polynomial because it, they could, you know, the, the pair you chose could, could have the property that their leading terms actually cancel each other when you add. So, for, so the assertion is that this set is not closed under addition. For example, if we take the quadratic polynomial x squared plus 3x plus 2, something like that, and add to it the quadratic polynomial minus x squared minus 5, those are two quadratics that just belong to the set S. So this one is in S, this one is in S, but their sum, well, the leading terms cancel when you add them, you get 3x minus 3, and this is not in the set S. So taking all the uh, polynomials of a fixed degree does not give you a subspace of a space of polynomials. That's just a remark, but P2, the set of all polynomials whose degree is at most two, uh, is a subspace. Okay, so a uh, second uh, example, just to have a few examples at our disposal. If we take a set of complex numbers, that is a vector space over itself as a field, it's also a vector space over the set of real numbers. So again, let's just recall what that means. It means that we can add together and subtract complex numbers. That doesn't take us outside the set of complex numbers if we do so. And we can multiply a complex number by a real scalar and get another complex number, so, which is certainly true as well. So within the set of complex numbers, the assertion is that the subset R consisting of the real numbers is an example of a vector subspace over the real numbers. So if we regard the set of complex numbers as a vector space over the set of real numbers, then the set of real numbers itself is a subset obviously of C, it's also a subspace of C, meaning that it's closed under addition, add together two real numbers, you get a real number, and it's closed under multiplication by real scalars. A remark here, and this is kind of a subtle point that's worth thinking about and that does often quite arise quite often, is that if you think about the set of complex numbers as being a vector space over itself, so you think of complex numbers as being the, the scalars, in that context, the set of real numbers would not be a subspace because the set of real numbers as a subset of the set of complex numbers is not closed under taking complex multiples. So if you regard your scalars as being complex numbers, then the set of real numbers would not be a subspace. But if you think of C as being a vector space over the set of real numbers, then it is. Okay, so an example of a subset of C that is not a real vector subspace, that's a typo, is the unit circle in the complex plane. So this is the set of all complex numbers of modulus one, consisting of all complex numbers whose real and imaginary parts have squares that sum to one. So that's, that's that, that set is closed neither under addition nor under multiplication by real scalars, which is certainly true. So in the complex plane, so this relates to example two, uh, in the complex plane, we obviously have the real and imaginary axes and every complex number is represented by a distinct point. In the complex plane, the unit circle the circle of radius one centered at zero in the complex plane. So it passes through the points one, i, minus one, minus i, and it consists of all those complex numbers whose modulus is one. And certainly if you take a pair of complex numbers whose modulus is one, such as one and i, for example, you don't expect that their sum 
but also has modulus one, and indeed it doesn't in that case. Also, if you take a complex number whose modulus is one, so which is represented by a point on this circle, and if you multiply it by a, by a scalar, a real scalar other than one or minus one, then you, you, you uh, scale its modulus by that scalar, so you don't uh, retain the property of uh, being located on this unit circle. So the set of complex numbers of modulus one is certainly an interesting set and an important one, geometrically and algebraically. It does have the property of being closed under the multiplication of complex numbers. Like if you take two complex numbers of modulus one and multiply them, you do, as a result, get a complex number of modulus one. That's a nice property of this set, but it doesn't relate to its to, to the vector space structure of C so much. So this uh, is, an, is an example of a set that's you know that has that has nice properties. Uh, but one of them is not being a vector subspace of the set of complex numbers considered as a vector space over the set of real numbers. Okay, here is a third example. So if we take R2 to be the usual Cartesian plane with its x and y coordinate axes, so the picture here would be like this. Oops. The Cartesian plane has a vertical axis which is typically labeled y and a horizontal axis, obviously, which is typically labeled x. And within R2, we can let u be the set of all of those points of R2 whose uh, x and y coordinates are both non-negative. So it consists of the positive side of the x-axis, the positive side of the y-axis, the, the origin itself, 0, 0, and all these areas and all the region in the sort of upper quadrant, upper right quadrant of the plane. Okay, so you here geometrically will be this kind of upper right quarter of the plane consisting of all those points whose x and y coordinates are both non-negative. So it includes the origin, but it doesn't include anything to the left of the y-axis or below the x-axis. Okay, so this set, we can ask ourselves, well, what, you know, what properties does it have? Is it a vector subspace of, the, of, of R2? It's certainly a, you know, a, a, a space that's important and interesting in lots of applications where you have to deal with things that have positive coordinates. Uh, it is closed under addition. So if you take a pair of vectors in U, you know, which might be represented as like directed line segments directed from the origin to somewhere in this upper right quadrant. So maybe something like that and something like that. And if we add them together, then we arrive at a vector that's somewhere up here and which is certainly still in U. So U has the property of being closed under addition. And in fact, we can see that probably even more easily by just thinking about two elements of U in the form of their coordinates. We have two elements of U, their X and Y coordinates are both non-negative. So when we add them together, we again get a pair, get a, a point whose X and Y coordinates are both non-negative. So U is closed under addition. It's also closed under multiplication by positive scalars, but it's not closed under multiplication by negative scalars. So if you take a point that's in U, and multiply it by a negative scalar, you'll end up with a point down here in the lower left quadrant, which, which consists of all the negatives of elements of U. So this is an example of a subset of R2 that kind of nearly meets the criteria for being a subspace. It is closed under addition. It's closed under multiplication by a lot of scalars, but not all of them. So it fails to be a subspace because it is not closed under scalar multiplication. Okay, so that's an example of a space that's closed on, of a set that's closed under addition, but not under multiplication by scalars. Okay, fourth example, and this is kind of a, um, you know, kind of a general example that, um, that, that, that that's sort of described here in, in, in slightly abstract terms. So just to get our hands on what it's actually saying, let us give, give ourselves kind of a specific example of it, maybe. I'm just gonna add a new page for some notes. So in example four here, we're asked to give ourselves, to think about a, a fixed, non-zero vector in R3. So here's a sort of particular example of the situation of example four. So for example, if we give ourselves an actual vector in R3, so let's, let's take the vector whose entries are two, one, minus three, for example. Okay, that's fine, we can, uh, we can do that. And then we define this thing, B with a, superscript of this kind of perpendicular symbol, which is referred to as, if, if we're reading it, a lot of people would read this as V perp, which looks like a strange form of word, but it's just short, shorthand for, for perpendicular. 
Uh, so this is, and, and so what this space is, it's the set of all vectors in R3. So we're thinking of R3 as a set of all column vectors with three entries in the real numbers. And V perp, the perpendicular space of V, is the set of all U in R3 such that the product U transpose V is equal to zero. So let's just bear in mind what that means. U transpose V, U is a three by one matrix. So U transpose is a one by three matrix. And U transpose V, is a one by three by a three by one matrix. So it's just a one by one matrix. It's just a scalar, it's just a number. And so basically what it is, of course, is the scalar product of U with V. So V perp, if you like, you could write it this way. It's the set of all U in R3 with the property that U transpose V is zero, but U transpose V is nothing but the set, the, the uh, number that you would get if you were to take the ordinary scalar product of u with v. So if you like, it's actually the set of things that are perpendicular to v as uh, vectors in R3. So for our example, we could notice, you know, we're looking for vectors that are orthogonal to 2, 1, minus 3. So if you just sort of deal with two coordinates at a time, if we were to take the vector, for example, if we were to put a 1 in the first coordinate and a minus 2 in the second, Let's call this one u1. This I claim is in the perpendicular space of this v that we started with, since if we take u1 transpose and multiply it by v, u1 transpose is 1 minus 2, 0. v is 2, 1 minus 3. And if we do that matrix multiplication, we get 1 times 2 plus minus 2 times 1 plus zero times minus three, so we get two minus two, which is zero. Okay, so this is an example of an element that's in that space. If we take u2, and this time maybe let's use the first and the third coordinates, which are two and minus three, so we'll sort of swap them and change the signs of one of them, and write three, zero, two. u2 also is orthogonal or perpendicular to v, because if we take the scalar product of u2 with v, we get three times two plus zero times one plus two times minus three, which is zero. And we can also observe then that every linear combination, you can check this, that every linear combination, so remember a linear combination of u1 and u2 is a vector that can be formed by taking a scalar multiple of u1 and adding to it a scalar multiple of u2. So every linear combination of that type is also orthogonal to v. So I'll let you check that you agree with that. If you have a look and try out a few linear combinations of u1 and u2, but if you want to kind of be satisfied with the reason for that, let's go back up to the sort of general description up here. So the uh, first assertion is that the, the orthogonal complement or the perpendicular space of v is not empty because the zero vector at least is there. That, that has the property that it's scalar product with everything is zero. Suppose we have a pair of vectors u1 and u2 that are perpendicular to v in the sense that this equation is satisfied by both of them in the case of u. Okay, then if we take the sum of u1 and u2, we have to we want to know does that also belong to this set, v perpendicular. So to answer that question, we have to look at the transpose of u1 plus u2 and ask whether its product with v is zero. Okay, well, we know that u1 plus u2 transpose is u1 transpose plus u2 transpose. And we also know that we can have we have this distributive property of a matrix addition. So this is u1 transpose v plus u2 transpose v. So if u1 and u2 are both in the orthogonal complement of v, then u1 transpose v and u2 transpose v are both zero and their sum is also zero. So we can conclude that v prep is closed under addition. Secondly, if u is in v prep, so remember what that means is that u transpose v, that matrix product is equal to zero. And if alpha is a real scalar, then to, add, then to determine whether or not alpha u, the scalar multiple of u by alpha, is also in v prep, we have to look at the transpose of that vector and ask whether it has a, whether, whether it gives us a zero product with v. So alpha is a real scalar here. u is a, a vector in R3. So the transpose of alpha u, which should be a one by three vector, is just alpha times the transpose of u. u transpose v is zero. So uh, if we multiply that by alpha, we still get zero. 
And so the conclusion is that the perp is closed under both addition and scalar multiplication in R3. So that according to the definitions, according to the axioms, it is a vector subspace of R3. And we just make the remark that uh, for any V, except, for, except, except if V is zero, that, and we, uh, we insisted at the start that V should not be zero, uh, that V is not orthogonal to itself. It doesn't have the property of having zero scalar product with itself. So this, this uh, space V perp defined by V for a non-zero vector in R3 is not the entire space R3, it's some, it's some subspace of it. And here's, there's an example with a particular choice of V. Okay, just a couple more remarks for this uh, installment. And the next one is just to introduce the idea of the linear span of a set within a vector space. So our setup as usual is that V is some vector space over a field F and S is a non-empty subset of V. So think of S as being a finite subset, just consisting of three or four elements of V. They might not be related to each other in any way. They're just different, they're just some, some, some elements of V. Okay, so if you have such a set, so think about, you know, think about choosing two or three elements of R3. Okay, so if you've got a set like this in your hands and it has no algebraic properties, it has no special kind of closure properties or anything like that. It's just a bunch of vectors, a bunch of elements in your space. So it could be a bunch of polynomials, with rational coefficients. If you're in QX, it could be a bunch of vectors with three entries if you're in R3. Okay, so the linear span or F linear span or just span of S, which is denoted, oops, it's a typo, it's denoted with this notation. The name of the set, which is S here, with kind of angle brackets around it. The span of S is defined to be a set of all linear combinations of elements of S in V. So the set of all elements of V that you can get by taking scalar multiples of elements of S and adding them together. Okay, so it certainly includes the elements of S themselves because you can take the linear combination whose coefficient for a particular element of S is one and the rest zero. So each element of S is, is in the span of S, but also anything that you can get by adding elements of S together, multiplying them by scalars, multiplying the result of that by scalars, adding results of that together are all in the linear span of S. Okay, so if S is equal to V, so if every element of V is a linear combination of elements of your set S, then S is called a spanning set of V, and this is a piece of lingo that we've been using quite a lot, and it means that every element of V is a linear combination of elements of S. Okay, and the lemma here says that if S is any subset of a vector space V, so S could consist of just one element or just two elements, it could be a very small finite subset of V, then the linear span of S is a subspace of V, and it's the smallest subspace of V that contains the set S. So we're not going to write out a detailed proof of this lemma, although you can, you can consult the lecture notes for a little bit more detail. But the uh, remark is that S is a subset of the vector space V. It doesn't have to be finite, but in our context, it usually will be finite. So S consists of some elements, V1 up to VK. And these are elements of a vector space V that comes to us already equipped with addition and with multiplication by scalars from the field F. Okay, so then the linear span of S is a set of all elements of this type, a set of all elements of the form A1 V1 plus A2 V2 up to AK VK, where the A's belong to the field of scalars F, which could be the rational numbers or the real numbers or whatever. The elements of S all look like this. And when you add together two elements that look like that, they'll have different coefficients, a, but they basically have the same kind of general appearance. And when you add them together, you again, you're just adding the coefficients for each of the elements of S. So you get again an element that looks like that, that is a linear combination of the Vs. And equally, if you multiply an element that looks like this by a scalar, you're effectively just multiplying all the coefficients by that scalar in the field F. So you again get a linear combination of the same elements. So S is a, is, is, is a subspace of this, sorry, the span of S, which consists of all these things is a subspace of V, and it's the smallest subspace of V that contains the set S. So some people would say it's, it's the subspace of V that's generated by the elements of S. If you have these elements of S in a subspace, then you have to have all the linear combinations as well within that subspace. Okay, that is, uh, that, that, that just follows from sort of the definitions, you know, that if you have any subspace that contains the elements V1 down to VK, then it has to be closed under addition, so it has to contain all the sums of the VIs, and this has to be closed under scalar multiplication. So it has to contain all scalar multiples of the VIs. 
And then it has to be closed under addition of those scalar multiples to each other as well. So it has to include every linear combination of disease. Okay, so yeah, so, so, so this, the, the linear span of any subset is the smallest subspace of the entire space that contains this subset. And it can be quite a big thing, even though the subset itself might be quite small. So here's an example. So let's go back to our friend, the space of all rational polynomials. And within that, we had this full subspace consisting of all polynomials of degree at most two, and we were calling that P2. So here is a subset of P2 consisting of just two elements. So S here is contained in P2. It certainly doesn't like being equal to all of P2. It just has two elements. And P2 is this huge, big, infinite set of polynomials. But if we want to know about the linear span of S within P2 or even within Qx, then the linear span of S consists of all elements that you can get by taking a scalar multiple of the first element of S and adding to it a scalar multiple of the second element of S. S only has two elements in this example. So the linear span, the Q linear span of S consists of all elements that we can get by taking the combination of x squared plus one and x plus one, each multiplied by a rational scalar and, uh, and then added together. So it's a set of all polynomials of the form a times x squared plus one plus b times x plus one. And you could leave it like that if you wanted to describe it. But if you want to write the typical elements of S as a sort of a, you know, in the typical form of a polynomial, you could write this, this is ax squared plus the coefficient of x is just b. This is the only appearance of x that we have. So ax squared plus bx. And then the constant term here is a plus b times one. So a times one plus b times one. So we have a constant term, a plus b. So the linear span of S is the set of all polynomials in Qx that have degree at most two and whose coefficients for x squared and x are just two, in, two rational numbers that are, you know, that are independent of each other, a and b here, but the, co the constant coefficient must be the sum of the coefficients of x squared and x. So if you were choosing an element of P2, you know, completely sort of randomly, you'd have completely independent free choices to make for the constant coefficient, the x coefficient and the x squared coefficient. If you're choosing an element of the linear span of this particular set S, then you don't have three, three independent choices to make. You can choose the quadratic coefficient to be whatever you want and the linear one. But once you've done that, then the choice of the constant coefficient is, is made for you. It has to be the sum of those two. So the linear span of S consists of all rational polynomials of degree at most two in which the constant coefficient is the sum of the coefficients of x and x squared. And you can, if you want, you can sort of take this subset of Qx without starting with the set S and just satisfy yourself that this is indeed a subspace of Qx. Okay, and so for example, we can observe that the element x squared plus two x plus three belongs to the linear span of S because its constant coefficient, which is three, is the sum of its quadratic coefficient, which is one, and its linear coefficient, which is two. But if we look at this other quadratic polynomial in Qx, it doesn't belong to the span of S because its constant coefficient, which is four, is not equal to the sum of its quadratic and linear coefficients. Okay, so that's the, the idea of the subspace spanned by a couple of elements. So maybe you, uh, it is gonna be an important one for us. So uh, if you feel like making up a few more examples of your own and just working with them to, to make sure that you have a good understanding of what's meant by the linear span of a subset, then that would certainly be be very useful for the next couple of sections. Okay, that's it for this one. Next time we'll talk about linear independence. Thank you very much, everybody.